Let's look at Bowie knives as featured in a period newspaper from Toronto describing the Bowie knife, its use at that time in the 1880s and indeed its origin with James Bowie. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore, and I went to do some research on the British Newspaper Archive. You will know that I've used the British Newspaper Archive previously when looking at tomahawks, and I will do again as well. There are some really good accounts of the use of tomahawks, and in fact all sorts of uh, violence and, and martial endeavours um, that get featured on this channel. And so I used the British Newspaper Archive for that, and also I used it a lot for researching officers who've owned antique swords that I own and sell. And, and research. So uh, British Newspaper Archive, highly recommended. I'll put a link below to it, um, which you might consider if you are a researcher yourself or you just want to have some extra reading. If you're a bit bored with modern news, then you can go and read past centuries news. So I decided to go and research some stuff on the Bowie knife or Bowie knife. I understand there's two pronunciations for this, Bowie, Bowie. I don't personally care very much. I say Bowie because I'm British. Um, now, the Bowie knife is incredibly famous. I own uh, quite a lot of examples. Um, in fact, I own uh, numerous modern made um, examples, but equally I do own antique examples as well and the British equivalents of. Um, so this, for example, is made by um, Brooks and Crooks of Sheffield. It's a 19th century um, hunting knife. And the British ones have particular characteristics to them, which I won't go into on this video. I've, I've featured them in the past. Very popular in India for uh, hunting. And, but this one has got the word explorer etched on it. Uh, and this was um, very common with uh, Bowie knives in the 19th century. And in fact, this replica has uh, the Patriot Self Defender written on it. And you often get um, patriotic American uh, messages and things to do with self-defense or things to do with exploration or hunting, these kind of frontiersman kind of um, motifs and uh, ideas. Now, when I went to research this, I immediately stumbled upon an article that is so long <laughs> uh, that I'm just going to do one video just on this because I figure that you'd be interested in it. Now, there's not going to be um, hardly any visuals on this, so it'll be quite boring for you to watch, but hopefully interesting for you to listen to. So if you want to avert your eyes and do something else, browse the internet, do some shopping, or indeed if you're just listening to this in your car or on your phone, then this is essentially a podcast episode. I'm just going to read through this article and I might make uh, a few personal comments here and there. First thing to mention is this is an article from 1886. So in many people's mind, this is the sort of, well, it's the Wild West era, isn't it? So it's the era of the Bowie knife, although it's kind of not. That era had already passed. And this is one of the myths, I guess, of the Wild West is that a lot of the things the frontier kind of uh, idea that people have of this period of time. Yes, indeed, there may have been a frontier out in the West in America, uh, but if you were in New York, then it was a big cosmopolitan city, a uh, completely different type of thing. Now, this is uh, an article from the Toronto Daily Mail. However, it is quoting the Baltimore Herald. OK, so um, this isn't a British, although it's on the British newspaper archive, it isn't a British newspaper. It is from the place where Bowie knives, uh, in theory anyway, were being carried and used. So let's see. Um, the article is called The Bowie Knife, How Its Inventor Carved His Way to Notoriety. Some stories of the most murderous weapon of its kind, a desperate duel and revenge, and killed uh, fighting at the Alamo. So, um, and this is, as I said, it's from the Baltimore Herald. It says, most readers of the Herald are familiar with the axiom laid down by the genial autocrat of the breakfast table, the race that shortens its weapons, lengthens its boundaries. He remarks that we are Romans of the modern world and that the American Bowie knife is a form of the Roman gladius, modified to meet the daily wants of civil society. <laughs> Time was when in certain sections of our beloved country, the Bowie knife was the daily companion of large numbers of our fellow citizens. Note that it's talking about the past here in 1886. 
Even congressmen have been known to carry them, and the large and muscular Potter of Wisconsin won no end of fame more than a quarter of a century ago by offering to fight a duel with the rather diminutive Roger Pryor, armed with this weapon. In these, our more peaceful days, the exigencies of society no longer require the genial influence of this famous weapon, and it is quite likely that many young readers have never even seen one. This is amazing. This is 1886. I would have thought that they were quite common at this time, but apparently not. A gentleman from the north many years ago had business which required him to stay for some time in Arkansas and the Indian Territory. It was in these wild times of the wild of the southwest when it was the universal custom to go armed. Ergo, it wasn't the universal custom to go armed in 1886 in Baltimore. Um, this gentleman purchased a bowie knife. Not a pistol, a bowie knife, but never carried it, except in his trunk. So there you go. Even in the past, this guy didn't buy a pistol. He bought a bowie knife for self-defense, but he didn't bother carrying it. He kept it in his trunk. On his return north, he brought it with him, where, after serving as a curiosity in the household for a time, it finally got into use in the kitchen as a butcher and bread knife. It was a finely tempered steel, easily sharpened, and became a favourite weapon to attack a loaf of bread with. <laughs> More than one visitor to that household was startled by the blood-curdling cry of one of the children to his mother. Mother! Where's the bowie knife? Mercy, would be the ejaculation of the visitor. What does the child want a bowie knife for? Oh, he only wants to cut a piece of bread for himself. And then the terrible knife would be produced amid much merriment. Quite different were its uses in the South. There, in the South, it was never debased to mere domestic objects, but served its legitimate purpose of maintaining order and decorum in society. During a session of the Arkansas legislature in, the 18, in 1837, the Speaker of the House had occasion to call a member to order. The member insisted on keeping the floor for the purpose of making an explana explanation, whereupon Mr. Speaker drew an immense bowie knife and advanced towards the offending member for the purposes of bringing him to order. <laughs> The member also drew his bowie knife and, as the speaker advanced, threw it at him, expecting to disable him. A feat that he'd performed more than once in the past. Unfortunately, though, he missed. He missed his aim and the knife fell ringing on the floor 30 paces away. The member straightened himself in front of his foe, who advanced deliberately and cut him down with one dreadful gash, killing him instantly. The gentleman, having thus been called to order, Mr. Speaker resumed his seat and the House adjourned for, th adjourned for three days to attend the funeral. We're told that Mr. Speaker was tried for the murder but was acquitted. Another story that had considered had considerable credence at one time was that at the Battle of Buena Vista, a regiment of Mississippians under the command of Jefferson Davis received a charge of Mexican cavalry in the shape of a V with the opened end towards the enemy. The cavalry riding in the open end were first greeted with a deadly fire from the rifles, after which the gallant Mississippians went at the and I can't read that word, unfortunately, because the word is blurred, um, with their bowie knives um, and almost entirely destroyed them. It goes on. In John Hay's poem, The Mystery of Gilgal, there is an account of a bowie knife encounter be between Judge Finn and Colonel Blood, in which they, quote, carved in a way that all admired, till blood drawed iron at last and fired, which took Seth Bloodzo betwixt the eyes and caused him a great surprise. <laughs> Poetry and history, having thus are united in illustrating the wonders of this renowned weapon, destined to a fame as great as that of Excalibur, the world-famous sword of King Arthur, it may not prove uninteresting to the readers of the Herald to give some account of its originator and inventor. James Bowie was born in Logan County, Kentucky in the year 1796, a good year for sword patterns. His parents were natives of Georgia, his father being a woodsman and hunter, in which craft James was brought up. The family wandered from place to place, usually seeking the remotest frontier, and finally settled on the borders of Louisiana and Texas. Here, in 1814, James Bowie made a clearing for himself, built a log cabin, 
and lived principally by fishing and hunting. Many were his deeds of daring and recklessness in his forest adventures, and many stories have been preserved of his wild exploits. He would catch and ride not only wild horses, but wild deer, and on one occasion he caught, roped and rode an alligator. <laughs> he grew to be a large and powerful man, six feet in height and extremely muscular. His temper is said to have been good, but he was easily aroused to anger, which was terrible and unappeasable, and led him into many a tragic encounter. He never fought a regular duel, but was engaged in many fights, most of which had a bloody termination. He was said to have been a general favourite amongst his friends and neighbours, which goes to disprove that he was of a cruel or bloodthirsty disposition. Texas at that time belonged to Mexico and was a sort of promised land to the adventurers of the southwest. One of the first expeditions into that country was under General James Long of Tennessee and Bowie accompanied it. This was in 1819. The expedition resulted disastrously, Long being captured and killed by the Mexicans, but Bowie returned safely to his home again. He now sold his land and in company with his brothers engaged in slave trading with the notorious Lafitte, the celebrated pirate of the Gulf. Under the laws of the United States at the time, slaves were not allowed to be imported into the country, but the brothers Bowie easily evaded that difficulty. Their plan of operations was to go to Galveston and purchase from Lafitte a number of Negroes, apologies for the expressions of the time, but this is a period newspaper, for which they paid at the rate of $1 a pound, or about $140 for each person. These they would bring into the limits of the United States and then go to a customs house officer and become informers against themselves. The law gave the informer half the value of the slaves, which were put up and sold by the United States Marshal. At the Marshal's sale, they would themselves become the purchasers, would receive half the purchase money back and a certificate of sale which entitled them to dispose of the slaves in the United States. Bowie followed this business until he made some $60,000, most of which he soon spent in riotous living in New Orleans. It was during these expeditions to Galveston that his genius evolved the hunting knife, with which his name will always be associated. It was made for him by a blacksmith after a design of his own. It was made with a heavy back so that it could be used in chopping as well as thrusting, thus fulfilling the purpose of a hatchet for which he used it in his woodsman life. In the exciting political contests that grew out of Jackson's advent as a candidate, Bowie took an active part. In 1826, he was residing at Alexandria on Red River, and during a political campaign, he got into an altercation with Norris White, sheriff of Rapides Parish. Bowie was unarmed, and Wright drew a pistol and shot him through the body. Just to pause for a second there, at this date in 1826, this pistol is almost certainly a, certainly in the United States, I would say a flintlock single shot pistol. So one barrel, one shot, and then you're done. Probably a, um, a flintlock. Percussion locks did exist, but I believe in the United States at this time, the vast majority of um, pistols would have still been flintlock. So Wright drew his pistol and shot him, i.e. James Bowie, through the body. But even then, if Wright had not been rescued by his friends, Bowie would have killed him with his fists. This attack so enraged him that he determined never thereafter to go about without his knife. And he had a scabbard made for it and said that he would wear it for as long as he lived. Now, very interesting that his reaction to being shot by a pistol was to bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> so literally, according to the story anyway, he decided thereafter to carry a knife for personal defence. Why? This is a massive um, question and maybe something I should address in a future video, but just very, very briefly, I would say, first of all, remember pistols at this time are single shot, essentially one use items. So if your shot hits a person in the chest or the head, brilliant. If it misses or it doesn't take effect, then you need a hand weapon. So the knife is always going to be useful. Additionally, 
as we've seen, even in uh, certain state congresses, you could carry a Bowie knife, but you probably wouldn't have been allowed in with a pistol. Um, so there were certain places, and this would have been true of some towns or cer- certain like um, pubs, taverns, inns. Uh, there would have been places where you weren't allowed to go in with a firearm, but you were allowed to go in with a knife. Let's move on. A year later, this feud with Sheriff Wright culminated in a terrible encounter at Natchez, which many of you would have heard about. In September 1827, two very respectable citizens of Louisiana, a Dr. Maddox and Samuel Wells, having a difference to settle, agreed to meet on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, the famous sandbar fight. And there are many different accounts of this, and they vary. Um, on the Mississippi, in a uh, sandbar in the Mississippi River opposite Natchez with a few friends where their differences would be reconciled according to the custom usual amongst gentlemen, aka a duel. They met, exchanged shots, and made friends. When retiring from the ground, however, Wells invited Maddox and his second, Colonel Crane, to the woods adjoining, where some others of his friends excluded from the field, were to take refreshments. Crane objected on the ground that there were certain men there that he could not meet. Wells then assented to go where Maddox's friends, who had also been excluded from the field, were. When on the way the party were met by the friends of Wells, who were James Bowie, General Curry, and another person, Crane and General Curry were mortal enemies and immediately drew their pistols. Crane had a pistol in each hand, and shot Bowie first and then Curry, the latter being instantly killed. At this, the friends of Maddox hurried to the scene, and among them was the Sheriff Wright, who had the encounter with Bowie a year before. Wright also fired at Bowie again, and he fell. A general firing ensued, and several others were killed also. Wright, seeing Bowie lying apparently dead on the ground, approached and bent over him, when Bowie suddenly drew his knife and stabbed Wright to the heart. He then rose, although severely wounded, and stabbed another of the party with his knife, and the battle then terminated. When he recovered from his wounds, he determined to leave the United States and take up residence in Texas, which of course was not part of the United States then. There he went in the year 1830 and engaged actively on the side of the revolutionists, his valour and daring soon gaining him a distinguished name in that country. He married a daughter of one of the ex-governors of the province and was appointed colonel of one of the Texas regiments. During the next few years, he was engaged in many fights with the Indians and with the Mexicans, in one of which he and nine or ten men succeeded in defending themselves against 150 Indians. Again, Native Americans, but we're using the language that is written on the page in front of me. With a loss of only one killed and two wounded. That's a very impressive um, comparison if it's true. His career was finally ended at the bloody Battle of Alamo, as I suspect most viewers of this know. He had been ordered to that place to take command, but a few days after he reached there, he was taken down with pneumonia and during the siege was confined to his bed. As is well known, Santa Ana, commanding 3,000 Mexicans, besieged the fort in the early days of March 1836. It had only about 150 defenders. After some days of attack, the place was stormed and every Texan was put to the sword. No one escaped. Bowie, sick in bed, is said to have shot down with his pistols and killed with his knife a number of his assailants before he yielded up his life, which we'll never know whether it's true or not and who reported that. Whether this is true or not, it is safe to assume that if he had strength and consciousness enough to do it, then it was done. The celebrated Colonel Davy Crockett, David Crockett, was also a victim of this massacre. Such is the story of the Bowie knife and its inventor. So really just to conclude and just to finish off, the Bowie knife was already a legend in America and around the world. Remember that these were being made in Sheffield. This is a Sheffield example, a modern one, but this is an actual Victorian Sheffield example that come in various sizes and shapes. Um, And Sheffield in England was churning out thousands and thousands of these and they were going all over the world, not just to America and obviously Canada, also to South America, um, also to the British Empire, out to India, down to South Africa, all over the place, uh, used primarily as, you know, hunting knives and general purpose sidearms, camp knives, things like this. 
And indeed, they were used as weapons. There are numerous accounts of them being used in weapons. And I think something that a lot of modern people, particularly people who've watched a lot of Wild West films, don't necessarily appreciate, is that in lots of uh, times and places in American history, the Bowie knife seems to have been a more popular sidearm, a more typical and common sidearm than a pistol was. Um, and remember that until uh, revolvers came along in the 18 end of the 1840s and really into the 1850s and even when revolvers came in they were very expensive most people who had access to a pistol or a firearm it was a single shot firearm um, mostly muzzle loading and uh, you know so that 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 changes the nature of the fight a lot if there are multiple opponents and you've got a pistol great you shoot one what do you do then so uh, bowie knives and swords and bayonets still very important bowie knives a legend already by 1886 and this article from the baltimore herald is clearly uh, describing things in you know a generation or even two generations in the past so it's already considering that the bowie knife's time has gone although it does make that very interesting note that that's true in the north but down in the south, Bowie knives are still being carried and used as weapons. Uh, and certainly in the 1860s, we see them on people's belts during the US Civil War, particularly the Confederates, it has to be said, um, which might support this statement here. Anyway, I hope this has been uh, interesting and illuminating. I would just also finally reiterate, this is one account of the adventures, uh, uh, misadventures of um, James Bowie. There are other accounts, there are some witness accounts that, that vary in detail. So this is just one account, but it was so meaty and so big, I thought I'd give you the whole thing because I wouldn't be able to fit it into a video where I'm doing a compilation. But I will, in the future, look at uh, Bowie Knives um, in other descriptive accounts from 19th century accounts. Um, if there's an appetite for it, do you want me to do that? Shall I, shall I dig out some more accounts of the use of Bowie Knives in period? I, I, I want to, so I hope you'll say yes. Anyway, um, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you back here again soon. I've been Matt Easton, and I will still be next time as well. See you soon, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.